when people talk about viruses and evolution, they talk about things like virus resistance, genes, and the uh, arms race between the host and the virus. I'm going to take a somewhat different tack, uh, really looking at some of the unique properties of retroviruses like HIV, by which they can make a DNA copy of their RNA genome and insert it into the host chromosome, the host DNA. And if that happens in what's called a germline cell, which is like an egg or a sperm, there's a potential that that DNA can be passed down through descendants. And that, be, that forms what we call an endogenous retrovirus. Now, that, we don't believe that's happening with HIV, but uh, it sort of casts a new light on the origins of HIV. This isn't just something that came out of the uh, other animals and transferred to us. The question is, you know, where is this from and where has it been around? So to explain endogenous retroviruses, I'm going to do a thought experiment about HIV, uh, which is an exogenous retrovirus because we can pass it from body to body outside of ourselves. But imagine if a man was HIV positive with a high viral load and the virus infected one of his sperm and that sperm fertilized an egg and that led to uh, the birth of a child. That child would have the HIV genome in every cell of its body, and that would be passed down to its descendants. Now, again, we don't really know, and it's unlikely that's happened yet. Although if HIV was around for a thousand years, it could. But uh, at that point, it would be an endogenous retrovirus. And in fact, this has happened many times during evolution because 8% of our DNA is endogenous retroviruses, uh, whereas our protein coding genes are only 1.5%. Think about that. Uh, now, Endogenous retroviruses are a subset of a larger class of mobile genetic elements, also known as transposable elements or transposons, which means they move things around in the DNA. And the purpose of these in evolution seems to be to generate genetic diversity. And they use like cut and paste mechanism or a copy and paste, just as when you do word processing. And cut and paste is sort of a rearrangement, but copy and paste is a duplication that makes something new. So that's better at expanding or amplifying the genome. Uh, the DNA transposons is that you cut and paste are less than 2% of our genome, but copy and paste is used by retro transposons, which work by RNA intermediate, uh, getting copied into DNA, inserted somewhere else in the genome. And that's how retroviruses work. Um, so including the endogenous retroviruses, these account for about 42% of our DNA, uh, which is huge. So to kind of explain this process of going from RNA to DNA, it really, was not believed to be possible in, for many years uh, after the discovery of DNA structure. It was believed that information flowed from DNA, was copied into a messenger RNA, and then decoded into a protein, or trans, uh, translated into a protein. And the process of reverse transcription, going back from RNA to making a DNA copy, uh, was discovered around 1970 in certain RNA viruses which were subsequently renamed retroviruses for this reason. So they use an enzyme called reverse transcriptase because it goes in reverse from RNA to DNA, which converts single-stranded RNA into a double-stranded DNA and has a module that can insert that into our, our cellular host DNA. Unlike DNA polymerases, reverse transcriptase does not have proofreading and Therefore, it's very error prone, which creates mutations. And for a virus like HIV, this is great because it can copy itself into a swarm of slightly different viruses, some of which are more fit than others and can evade your immune system, and then others might be non viable, but that doesn't matter because it just makes lots and lots of them. Now, the difference between RNA and DNA is really a single oxygen atom. Uh, ribose has it, and DNA loses that oxygen from deoxyribose. And it's key to the difference because it makes RNA more chemically reactive, also somewhat unstable. And it makes RNA be more versatile than DNA. And there's something called the RNA world hypothesis, which was developed uh, quite a ways back and was based in part on early experiments on abiogenesis, trying to simulate conditions of life on Earth, simulated lightning bolts going off in a blast of chemicals, and that uh, you could show you would get amino acids, it could be proteins. Subsequent work tended to point in the direction that RNA precursors might have arose before DNA precursors. Uh, and there was other lines of evidence, such as the discovery of catalytic RNA and 
the realization that DNA biochemistry is an add-on to RNA synthesis. And the modern consensus is that RNA evolved before DNA. Uh, at least some early genomes were RNA, and some of those were probably copied into DNA um, over three billion years ago at the dawn of the DNA world. By definition, this means there must have been the reverse transcriptase enzyme to copy that RNA into DNA, which means that the essential definitive enzyme of retroviruses and retrotransposons has been around since the dawn of DNA life as we know it. Now, the retroviral reverse transcriptase, it's a type of DNA polymerase, makes DNA from RNA, and it's basically a molecular machine for the generation of genetic diversity and disruption because it disrupts because it inserts that copy somewhere else at random and could disrupt a gene. DNA polymerase, in contrast, is a molecular machine for the maintenance of genetic fidelity uh, because it has proofreading and it's a highly accurate enzyme, and that's its mission. This gives a rise to a sort of primordial duality, or yin-yang, if you like, of reverse transcriptase versus DNA polymerase. Uh, a balance between genetic change and genetic stability, and that's been going on throughout the evolution of life. And these retro elements are that remnant of the change side, the dark side, if you will. Now you can view them in evolution as escaped retrotransposons. Retroviruses, modern retroviruses, uh, have this outer envelope uh, protein that enables them to, when they get out of the cell, to reattach because this protein is like a key to a cellular lock and the virus can get in and the membrane fusion releases this capsid and this is the internal life cycle of the virus. But you can imagine before that envelope gene was acquired, this life cycle could have gone inside the cell and that's really what retrotransposons did. And so early on in evolution they may have been very simple but then they slowly acquired these different proteins. Now, if we look at this envelope protein, uh, this attaches to a cell receptor. But you can imagine that when the virus infects a cell, it takes over and makes its proteins, and so this protein is being made on the surface of this cell. So an infected cell can bind and merge with an uninfected cell in the same way as the virus entry. And that leads to these giant multi-nucleated cells, which are called syncytia, and they're characteristic of many viral infections because a lot of viral infections use this kind of mechanism. Here you see one in uh, SARS lung tissue, uh, and you see this giant multi-nucleated cell. Why am I talking about this? Because it's relevant to a major incident where a retrovirus had an impact on the evolution of mammals, actually. And just to show you again how this works, you've got this coat protein, renal protein, uh, that attaches to its receptor, and then the membrane spews, and the viral material is put inside. And if this was an infected cell, it would have the same protein on it from the virus. It could attach to another cell, and this would be the nucleus, joining with the nucleus, and you'd get something like that. So, it turns out, if you look at uh, what happens uh, in the human fertilization, Something happened about 150 million years ago when mammals emerged. Essentially, a retroviral envelope protein was co-opted to assist embryo implantation uh, and evolution of the placenta. And so the last stage of uh, the early first week or so of the fertilization, you get something called the blastocyst, which is implanted in the uterine wall, and it uses the retroviral envelope protein to cause cell fusion, because the blastocyst is an, it's an egg, it's maternal tissue, maternal genes, and so is the cell wall. So it's the same kind of cells making the same receptors. The retroviral uh, envelope protein, called the syncytion now, uh, binds to it and they fuse, and so it enables the blastocyst to basically melt its way into the uterine wall, so by means of this. And this was a, a huge revolutionary breakthrough and evolution that led to mammals. And uh, this is just a close-up showing that process. And here is Gray's anatomy, uh, well, probably a 100-year-old drawing. And you can see this multinucleated uh, giant cell there here uh, as it comes in to the uterine tissue. 
And later on, there was different recaptures of, of other endogenous retroviral envelope genes in specific mammalian lineages. So it really suggests that this was a, a big event in evolution. Another one involved the loss of the terminal enzyme for vitamin C synthesis early in primate evolution. And the divergence of apes and monkeys from the wet-nosed primates, like this lemur here, uh, who's got this dog-like nose, uh, coincided with the loss of ascorbate synthesis. So the enzyme that was the last step in vitamin C synthesis was disrupted by the insertion of alu elements, which are a type of retrotransposon that spread in genomes during primate evolution. And if you look at this uh, online database of human genes and genetic phenotypes, it talks about this Dulo gene, terminal enzyme for ascorbate synthesis, which is blocked, not present, or disrupted in humans and our primate cousins. And this database entry says it's called hypoascorbemia. All members of the human species lack the ability to synthesize ascorbic acid. This man, unlike most other mammals, does not possess the enzyme melanolactone oxidase. We might say it's a public inborn error of metabolism which means that the entire human race suffers from a genetic disease. And what's interesting about this is that it means that uh, this disrupted mutation must have had conferred some selective advantage to become fixed in the genomes of the species that descended from that individual. And we are all descendants of that one primate who first had this mutation, had this genetic defect. And this is if, if you knew someone who had a genetic disease uh, and in the modern world, and you look at that person and say, oh, this is really terrible, this guy's got a genetic disease, uh, he's got to have a special diet, he has to eat all these fruits and vegetables, you know, or his teeth are going to fall out, and it's really terrible, but yet that person becomes the progenitor of you know, future spaceman or whoever. And that's the equivalent of what happened in the evolution of humans uh, with this gene. Now, Jack Chalum and I published a paper about 16 years ago where we suggested, well, how did this work? Is vitamin C so important? How could the loss of that be so revolutionary? Well, we've suggested that maybe it accelerated evolution by increasing the rate of mutations because vitamin C is an antioxidant and you'll have more free radicals and more mutations if you don't have that antioxidant. And we were also the first, I think, to point out that a retrovirus might have been involved in this key step in human evolution. And interestingly, um, the Japanese group that first identified, uh, found this disrupted gene in the human DNA, they went back about five years later, published a paper in which they used kind of um, molecular clock, DNA clock type of analysis. And they, they said, yeah, actually the, the disruption where these allo elements were inserted happened right around the time that these primates diverged. And so it's, it's not absolute proof, but it's fairly compelling evidence that this really was, uh, this allo insert retroviral event was the key step in this. So there's new discoveries being made all the time about endogenous retroviruses in human biology. And there is, here's one that was just published a couple months ago, and this is huge. It's about human stem cells. We've all heard about embryonic stem cells. They're very controversial, but they're learning how to make stem cells out of, from adult tissue and all of that. And stem cells are these cells like this that can differentiate into almost any type, in this case, a neural cell. So that's why there's so much excitement about their potential in medicine, that they can be used to cure all kinds of diseases. Well, it turns out in this work, they showed that if you block the expression of a certain human endogenous retrovirus, you block its RNA from being expressed in the cell, that the stem cells basically lose our ability to differentiate and into different cell types, which is the key thing of, of stem cells. So this is you know, quite a radical implication um, for another role of retroviruses, endogenous retroviruses. And apparently this is more unique to humans. So this must be an even more recent evolutionary development. Uh, we don't see it in some other species, although it's so early to say. So certainly showing there's ongoing new developments in retrovirus research. I want to end with a provocative thought. Um, did retro elements invent sex? And uh, mm -hmm. this, this is the title of a paper by Howard Temin, who shared the Nobel Prize with David Baltimore for discovering reverse transcriptase in 1970. 
Um, and his paper, Sex and Recombination in Retroviruses, he talks about the fact that in the retroviral particle, there are two copies of the RNA genome. And that's just like the definition of sex. You get, it, you get, a set of, you get your genes from your mother and your father, and then you have two copies, and then you can uh, compensate for defects and have a better chance of surviving and doing well. And he pointed out that, well, if you look in this retrotransposome from yeast, uh, they have a virus-like particle with a capsid around the RNA. And guess what? It's also got two copies of the RNA, which suggests that this is an ancient feature predating the divergence of fungi and animals, which is over a billion years ago. So this has been going on a very long time. So at the very least, retro elements were very early adopters of sex, if not the actual inventors. But then the question arises, how do the two copies of the RNA genome hook up in the retroviral particle? Um, and the answer is kind of surprising, although maybe not so surprising, because they hook up by kissing. That's where it starts. Uh, and they actually call this a technical scientific term. They call this a kissing loop. Uh, there's a loop on each of the RNA strands, and they have a complementary region that base pairs Watson Crick base pair that then kind of zips up into this very intimate embrace here. And when that happens, these, these regions are exposed that can bind to that capsid protein and make the shell around it. So that's probably been going on. And, and I wonder if they really brought this. If you look at it, all that's required for that interaction is just RNA. This is just two RNA strands, you know, kissing and getting it on. And it makes a lot of sense to me that that would have been an important thing in the RNA world because you know, they didn't have these proofreading DNA polymerases, uh, RNAs and unstable genetic material. And, but if they had two copies, then they would actually have a chance to survive. So I suspect that this actually started back in the RNA world and reverse sense cryptase and the retro elements just carried it forward into the DNA world. Um, and certainly the argument is that in the RNA world, they probably needed sex even more than we do, if you can believe that. Um, so, uh, to end, I just want to say, uh, hopefully this has cast some light on maybe the origin of retroviruses. They're not just something that, you know, some alien thing came from a different planet. They are more like escaped or renegade uh, genetic elements that have gotten out of the primate genome and more ancient genomes and have <coughs> been doing what they're doing. But there's a good side to them. They've done a lot of interesting things in evolution. Uh, and I've told you some of them we wouldn't be here without them. So I encourage you all to get in touch with your you know, retro, inner retrovirus <laughs> and, and appreciate what it's done in making us who we are. Uh, and that's it. <laughs>